Today, we're beginning the first of a brand new sermon series. We spent several weeks earlier this year dealing with the life of Elisha the prophet. And today we begin this new sermon series from the New Testament. It's a sermon series looking at Jesus through the lens of John, the disciple of Jesus. We've entitled this sermon series, I Encounter Jesus. And each one will have a subtitle. Um, and we are going to be covering this over the next several weeks. Uh, the Gospel of John is, is such a powerful, powerful book. Um, we could preach for a whole year, 52 weeks, and not even cover everything in there. Uh, we're not going to do that. Uh, we're going to kind of pick and choose some of the highlights. And, and hopefully it will give you a better picture of Jesus. Hopefully you will have a personal encounter with Jesus as you see the story of Jesus told through the eyes of John, the disciple. Let us pray. Father God, as we open your word today, we invite you to open our eyes. May we see you as John attempts to reveal the glory and the majesty of Jesus to each of us. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. From my earliest years as a child, I was, maybe this isn't working, is it? From my earliest years as a child, I was a horse lover. Now there were certain things I didn't like. My mom couldn't convince me, my dad couldn't convince me to get in the water. I was not a lover of water like my two sisters, but I was a lover of horses, and I guess maybe I was named appropriately. If you know anything about the name Philip, it actually means, comes from the Greek word philos, which means friend or love, and hippos, which is the Greek word for horse. So, Philip, the lover of horses, I've always loved horses. And I remember as a kid when we had our own horses, some of the most exciting days of my life as a child were riding my horse and our other horses. We made a move when I was 10 years old from the state of Washington to Colorado. And because we were in the process, my parents were in the process of developing a piece of property and building a home, um, it was not yet ready to uh, have our horses on. We moved our horses from Washington to Colorado. And, and so, uh, you know, my dad made arrangements with someone to board our horses in this humongous pasture. And there were other horses in there too. And, you know, we, we didn't have opportunity to ride them as much as we wanted to, but uh, they had this this free reign of, 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 I don't know, 20, 30, 40 acres. I don't know how many it was, but it was along down by the river, and the horses just had a wonderful, wonderful time. It was down by the Platte River. And we had two horses. A mare called Snowflake. My grandpa, my uncle rather, my grandpa's brother, was a horse lover. In fact, he raised horses, and he gave us this horse when our older horse died. He felt sorry for us, and he gave us Snowflake. Snowflake was a beautiful uh, uh, POA, Appaloosa, and uh, he, gave it, uh, he gave her to us. He says, you know, he said, um, she's a good horse. It'd be great for you, but he says, I can't use her anymore. You see, he raised horses. He bred horses. And, and Snowflake, he told us, couldn't have, she couldn't foal anymore. She wasn't capable of, of, of having any more babies. And so he knew that wasn't our purpose, but he says, she's a great mare, a good kid's horse. You'll love her. And so he gave us Snowflake. And I had many fun days riding Snowflake. And, 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 and we also had another horse. His name was Prince. 
We had raised him, I had raised him from the time he was born. And um, we took Prince and Snowflake with us to Colorado. And oh, they had a great time out in this humongous pasture. And, and I never will forget, one day, Dad told me, he said, come on, Phil, he says, we need to go down. I got something I want to show you. And we went down to visit the horses. And there I could see off in the distance, Snowflake running through the field. But there was something very interesting alongside Snowflake. Snowflake had a baby. And I couldn't believe it. In fact, my dad couldn't believe it. He says, you know, he says, my Uncle Tom told me Snowflake could never have babies. That's why they weren't worried about Prince, the stallion, running with her. Well, something happened, and Snowflake had a baby. In fact, over the next couple of years, Snowflake ended up having two babies. And I had the joy of raising those and breaking those uh, young horses. But I remember how excited I was. I mean, this was just totally out of the blue. I wasn't expecting to, to have another little horse. And, 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 and I was so excited about it, and I couldn't wait get, to get back and tell all my friends, Hey, guess what? We've got another horse. We've got a baby, a little filly. She was gorgeous, beautiful, black. Her mother was white, she was black. Have you ever encountered something, a piece of news, something that you experienced in your life that you were so excited about you couldn't wait to tell somebody else. I mean, you were just thinking, hey, wow, I, I got to get out my phone. I got to call everybody on my contact list. You know, I got to get on Facebook. I got to uh, tell it here, spread it there. I've got to email it out. I've got to, I've got to tell everybody. I'm so excited about what I just found out. I'm sure you've had experiences like that in your life. This morning, I would like for you to open your Bible to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. As I told you, we're going to be taking a journey through the Gospel of John. I'd like you to open there to John, chapter 1. John approaches the Gospel, or the good news about Jesus, from a very interesting perspective. You know, Matthew writes his story of Jesus as a disciple of Jesus in a very orderly uh, manner. I mean, when you read the Gospel of Matthew, you can tell that with his attention to detail, that it's not a far stretch to imagine that he was probably a pretty good accountant, tax collector. And when you read Luke's Gospel, you definitely know he's a doctor, a physician. And when you come to John's encounter and John's presentation of the gospel, John is the one that presents a theology. This whole grand understanding of Messiah. And he presents his gospel in, in, in ways that Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not. In fact, as uh, you open John chapter 1, uh, he doesn't begin with telling about the birth of Jesus. You know, unlike Matthew and Luke, he's not talking about the birth of Jesus. He starts his introduction uh, to, to his whole um, uh, thesis on the life of Jesus in a very interesting manner. You see, rather than tracing it back to his birth as a human, John actually traces the lineage, the history of Jesus all the way back to eternity. Will you take a look at what he does here? John chapter 1 and verse 1. Notice it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. John is presenting the fact he's not introducing Jesus as a baby in Bethlehem. He is introducing Jesus as one who coexisted with God, who was God from eternity. He is making a case for the identity of God, of Jesus, as God the Son. In verse 4 it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. John establishes the identity of Jesus as the divine Son of God. One who coexisted from the very beginning of time. Something that our minds cannot even wrap around. That God has always, that Jesus, the Word, has always coexisted with God the Father. And that is something that I don't care what you do, friends, your brain will never comprehend it. And then he says, Jesus is the light. But notice what happens in verse 5. It says, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, you know, most of the time, um, when you turn on a light in the dark, <laughs> you know the light exists. You know, wow, I can see. But John says that the light came on, and nobody even realized it came on. That Jesus entered the scene and nobody even realized it. And so, so in this introduction, it, it, G, uh, John is, is beginning to share this story about Jesus. And he's kind of telling us, hey, this is what's going to happen. I'm telling you this story about how God came down in the flesh. He's always existed from the beginning. He is divine. He is the word of God. But you know what? He wasn't accepted. And so he's kind of giving us a, a, a brief preview of the story that he's going to tell in detail through the life of Jesus and the encounters that he had uh, with people during his time. And then he goes on and he says in verse 6, he talks about how this man, John the Baptist, came on the scene and how he was a witness uh, to, uh, to Jesus and, and, and it moves down, and it says, it, it, it describes him uh, that John was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Sadly, John presents a picture of a world that didn't recognize the light. Of a world that rejected the light. Of a world that was in darkness, that so much needed the light, but it could not comprehend the light. And he further develops that in verses 10 and 11. He says, he was in the world and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. So John is giving us this foretaste of what's going to take place in, again in the stories that he is now going to tell about the life of Jesus. I like the way that uh, it's put in the book Desire of Ages, page 138. It says, The words which the priests and rabbis so much desire to hear, that Jesus would now restore the kingdom to Israel, had not been spoken for such a king they had been waiting and watching. Such a king they were ready to receive. But one who sought to establish in their hearts a kingdom of righteousness and peace, they would not accept. They were not ready for the light because they were looking for something totally different. And so when he came, John says, they rejected him. John, as I said, is setting the stage for sharing the gospel message 
as he encountered it. So far, it doesn't sound like anyone is going to encounter Jesus and accept him. But then notice what he says in verses 12 and 13. He says, but as many as received him. So apparently there were some who received him. John's now telling us, hey, listen, you know, the world didn't receive him, but yet there were some who did. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And then he begins to unpack the story. After he has made this introductory presentation about what Jesus is going to encounter and establishes his identity as the Son of God, coexisting from eternity with God the Father. He now begins the story. And he says in verse 14 that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the original Greek, it's the word t that means to, he tented. It's, it's the concept of, 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 of tenting and in, in in, to put it in so many words, that Jesus came down and he pitched his tent in the middle of us. He dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so he's telling about how Jesus came down, and, 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 and John, the Baptist, began to set the stage for the coming of Jesus and how he was out, uh, verses 19 and following, in the wilderness. He was this voice in the wilderness proclaiming that the Messiah was soon to come. He was calling people to uh, make responsible choices. He identifies himself in verse 23 as the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, taken from the prophecies of Isaiah the prophet. The Pharisees and spiritual leaders there during that time, you know, they didn't take too well to what John the Baptist was saying. They didn't like what he was saying. Because John was presenting someone, was presenting to them a Messiah that they were not ready to accept. You know, if... if, if if John the Baptist was, would have told them, hey, listen, there's somebody coming and he's going to have this great army and he's going to have all kinds of soldiers and, and swords and all of that kind of stuff, man, they would have been ready to get on board because they were looking for somebody to free them from Roman oppression. And John the Baptist is making a case that Jesus is coming to free them from sin. And that wasn't what they wanted to hear. That was what they needed but that wasn't what they wanted to hear. They were more concerned about the oppression they were receiving from the Roman government than the oppression that they were receiving from the devil himself. And then we come to verse 29. It says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me. For he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And so John is now, John the Baptist is now introducing the Messiah who is coming on the scene. He's making, uh, the, preparing the way for Jesus. And then John, who would become the disciple, begins to tell the story about how Jesus began his earthly ministry. Verse 35, again the next day, John stood with two of his disciples. This is John the Baptist now. Stood with two of his disciples. And looking at Jesus, as he walked, he said again, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, translated teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come 
and see. They came and saw where he was staying. And they remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of the two that heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You, are, uh, you shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. So Andrew has this encounter with Jesus. Andrew, who had been a disciple of, of uh, John the Baptist, he now starts following Jesus because John says, Behold the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. And so, and so uh, you know, Andrew says, Hey, i got, I got to follow him. If this truly is the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world, if this truly is the Messiah, then I've got to follow him. And along with him, the other follower was John. And the two of them followed Jesus, and, and it says that Andrew, as they encountered Jesus, they spent the night with him, and the next day, Andrew was so excited about this, he says, my goodness, he says, i got to go find my brother Peter. i got to tell him all about this. We found the Messiah. And so he goes and he tells this to Peter, and he brings Peter to Jesus, and, and his name isn't Peter at that time, it's Simon, and, and Jesus changes his name, and, and, and Peter now becomes a follower of Jesus. Why? Because Andrew had an encounter with Jesus, and he says, I can't keep this news to myself. I got to share it with my brother. I got to tell the rest of my family about it. And so now, notice what happens next. In verse 43, it says, The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and he said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So he obviously knew Andrew and Peter that came from the same town. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Now I think it's interesting. <laughs> you know, there was obviously still a little bit of skepticism probably uh, on the part of, of Philip. Because when Philip goes and he tries to sell uh, uh, Jesus to Nathanael, Notice what he says. He describes him as Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. You know, he's not quite ready to make that plunge and to sell him off as the son of God. No, he's the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth had a bad reputation. It was a bad town. A lot of things bad had happened. It was, it was notorious. I mean, hey, take a look. When Jesus finally came back in the Gospel of Luke chapter 4, we, we read that last week. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 4, when Jesus came to, to his own town and he stood up on the Sabbath to, to read in, uh, from the Isaiah scroll. After he was doing it and he proclaimed himself as Messiah before his own uh, uh, fellow citizens of the community he grew up in, they took him out to a hill and tried to kill him. Try to push him over a cliff. These people from Nazareth, they were crazy people. And yet that's where Jesus came from. And so, you know, Nathaniel knew that. There's a bunch of hoodlums from, from uh, Nazareth. And he says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. Hey, I'm not going to make that case. I'm going to let you come and see for yourself. Verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? You know, <laughs> Jesus, how, how do you know me? I mean, you, you, you're telling me an Israelite in whom is no deceit. How, how do you know what kind of person I am? And then Jesus says this to him. Behold, and <clears throat> he says, before Philip called you, verse 48, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathaniel, I know you. You know, I was there when you were born. I was there when you were conceived. 
I know exactly who you are. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. I can only imagine that. Uh, Philip, you told me he was the son of Joseph. Uh uh. This guy's the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And notice what Jesus said. Jesus answered and said to him, verse 50, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. He told Nathanael, he says, Wow. He says, Because of your confession of faith right now, you are going to experience things that are so much greater. An interesting story we find in John chapter 1. John making a case for the identity of Jesus. Jesus isn't a mere human. Jesus has coexisted from eternity with God the Father. He is God in the flesh. He has come down now veiled in the flesh, to have a personal encounter with mankind. And, and, and I was thinking in, in what Kurt was reading in our, our uh, call to worship this morning about Moses and appearing on the mountain with God. Here it is, fast forward in time. Jesus coming now down, God in the flesh, veiled in human flesh so that mankind could tolerate it. If he hadn't been veiled in the flesh, they couldn't have even handled it. But Jesus came to dwell among men so that they could have a personal encounter with him. I want you to think about that, folks. We live in a society that is so concentrated on me we are so me-focused. It's all about me. Jesus presents the epitome of one who is altruistic, one who is not thinking about himself, one who is thinking about everyone else. And Jesus leaves the splendor of heaven. Jesus comes down in the flesh. Jesus comes down so that each and every person could have a personal encounter with him, you and me included. Hallelujah. And yet sadly, the author John says that the world did not receive him. It blew him off. They rejected the light. The light came into the darkness, but hey... Phew, it continued to be dark for them because they weren't looking for that kind of light. There are a couple of lessons that I want you to take away from what we've discovered here in the Gospel of John chapter 1. Lesson number 1. Jesus says to each of us, come see me. And if you'll notice the sermon title in the bulletin, there's a play on words. Come see me. And he invites us to have a personal encounter with him. You see, the invitation wasn't just to John and Andrew and Philip and Nathaniel and Peter, that invitation is to each and every one of us here today. Jesus says, come see me. Come have a personal encounter with me. Jesus invites him to see, us, to, to see him as the Word. Jesus invites us to discover him as the Messiah. Jesus invites us to, to, to see him as the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Your sins and mine. Lesson number one we need to come away with. Jesus 
says to each of us, come see me, and invites us to have a personal encounter with him. Lesson number two. When we encounter Jesus and experience his life-giving change, he encourages us to invite others to come and see him too. You see, when Andrew encountered Jesus, when he and John spent that night with Jesus, when they followed him to, to where he stayed and, and, and they spent that night with him the next day, Andrew was so excited. What did he do? He went and got his brother Peter. Hey, wow, we found the Messiah. Come. When Jesus invited Philip to become one of his followers, Philip was so excited about it, he had to go find Nathaniel. And he had to go and tell him, hey, listen, we have found the one we've been looking for. Messiah, the Son of God, He's here. When we encounter Jesus and experience His life-giving change, He encourages us to invite others to come and see Him too. A personal encounter with Jesus leads us to share Him with others. It becomes that news that's so exciting that we can't wait to tell everyone we know. But I want to ask you a question. Why is it that we find it so easy to talk about everyone else and everything else except Jesus? Have you ever noticed that? Think about it, friends. Why is it so easy for us to talk about everyone else and everything else except Jesus? Listen to this from the book Desire of Ages. With the calling of John and Andrew and Simon and Philip and Nathaniel, began the foundation of the Christian church. John directed two of his disciples to Christ. Then one of those, Andrew, found his brother and called him to the Savior. Philip was then called and he went in search of Nathaniel. These examples should teach us the importance of personal effort, of making direct appeals to our kindred friends and neighbors. There are those who for a lifetime have professed to be acquainted with Christ, yet, listen to this, folks, yet who have never made a personal effort to bring even one soul to the Savior. They leave all the work for the minister. He may be well qualified for his calling, but he cannot do that which God has left for the members of the church. Did you catch that? Think about it. I remember when we were making a decision to build a home way after we had moved to Calhoun, Georgia. Some of you have heard me share bits and pieces of this story at times in the past. We finally found a builder. His name was Dan. And I remember some of the discussions I had with Dan when we were building the house and Dan was a good old Southern boy, Southern Baptist boy. And sometimes he would ask me some questions, some Bible questions, and, you know, he'd want to engage me in conversation about that. I was never pushy with him. I would try to answer him his questions where I could, always praying that God would give me an opportunity. That was 2003, the fall of 2003, and into 2004, and three years passed before I ever saw really connected on a consistent basis with Dan again. And he called me up one day, and he says, man, he says, i got to talk to you. He says, I've been reading my Bible, and he says, it's causing me to ask questions that, 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 that I need answers to. And he says, I think you've got them, Pastor. I think you can tell me. No, he wanted to know. He says, you know, what, why do you worship on the seventh day of the week? Why do you worship on Saturday? And, and then he says, hey, and while you're at it, he says, why don't, you tell me about, uh, why don't you tell me about why you don't eat pork? And then he starts hitting me with this and that and the other thing. I says, whoa, wait a minute, Dan. I says, you've asked me some really good questions, and I'd like to answer them for you. He says, good. He, he was driving back from a job. It was Friday evening. He was driving back from a job in Atlanta. He says, man, he says, I got an hour before I'm home. He says, start talking. And I says, oh, no, I'm not going to tell you now. Well, he says, well, why not? 
And um, I, I says, well, Dan, you know, you've asked me some really, really good and really important questions. But I says, let me ask you a question. I says, when you came to build our home, the very first day that you showed up on the job, you showed up with the shingles, didn't you? And he says, no, I didn't. What are you talking about? I says, come on, you had all the roofing material there. And he says, no way. And I says, why didn't you show up with the roofing material? He says, well, because you weren't ready for it yet. And I says, well, why not? And he says, well, you know, other things had to be done. We didn't even have the framework for the house yet. I says, okay. I says, so you showed up with all the plumbing, the bathtubs and faucets and all. No, no. He says, we didn't. Why not? Well, he said, for the same reason. We weren't ready. I said, okay. I says, you showed up with the kitchen cabinets and, and all of that. No, no, we didn't, Pastor, we didn't. And I, and I he said, what are you getting at? I says, I want to ask you. I said, what was the first thing you did? And he says, well, I had to make a foundation. I said, why? And he says, well, if I hadn't put in a foundation, the rest of the structure wouldn't have stood and would not have been ready for the shingles and the sheetrock and everything else. And I says, okay, Dan, you just proved my point. Well, you've asked me some very valid questions and questions I want to answer for you. I said, will you let me build the foundation so you're ready to hear it? And he says, wow. He says, when can we start? We got together eventually and started studying and had a magnificent, magnificent study. We, we invited some other people from the church and, and we used to have a, a regular study with them. They started coming to church every Sabbath and, and we had a regular Bible study with them. And before it was all over, Dan and his wife and his two children, we baptized them and they became part of the Adventist family. Dan's sister, Dan's brother-in-law, Dan's niece, and finally, the very, very last ones that we baptized, the last Sabbath that we were there was Dan's father and mother. Hallelujah. But you know, the story didn't end there. <laughs> Dan had, and still has to this day, his Bible. You know, he, he, his Bible sits on the front seat of his vehicle, and he's always ready to use it. He's got all kinds of literature, and he's always ready to find an opening wedge to tell somebody about Jesus. Pastor Jan and I were just out there in Calhoun, Georgia, in June for a couple of days. We stopped by Dan's shop to visit him, and, you know, Dan says, uh, you know, we're kind of having a bit of a hiatus right now. Uh, during the summer, but he says, we're going to start it up again soon. He says, um, I have a regular Bible study group, and he says, I got a bunch of my subcontractors. They're coming to these Bible study groups, and some of those people are starting to get excited about Jesus and knowing the truths of his word, and I say, hallelujah, and that's exactly what the gospel of John chapter 1 is trying to point out. When you have a personal encounter with Jesus, you can't help but tell other people about it. When Jesus has changed your life, you get excited about it and you want to tell the world about it. Hey, I want everybody to know what Jesus has done in my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus invites us to know Him as the Word, as the eternal God. He invites us to experience Him as the light of the world. Then He invites us to invite others to accept His invitation to come see me. Desire of Ages again. There are many who need the ministration of loving Christian hearts. Many have gone down to ruin who might have been saved if their neighbors common men and women had put forth personal efforts for them. Many are wa uh, waiting to be personally addressed in the very family, the neighborhood, the town where we live. There is work for us to do as missionaries for Christ. If we are Christians, this work will be our delight. No sooner is one converted than there is born within him a desire to make known to others what a precious friend he has found in Jesus. Saving and sanctifying truth cannot be shut up in his heart. Wow. You've heard me say it before, friends. You'll hear me say it again. There are 130,000 people in Simi Valley that need to hear the complete good news about Jesus. The harvest is ripe. Where are the laborers? Are you ready to respond to his invitation to come see me? 
to have a personal encounter with Jesus? And then, are you willing to share that invitation with others? John, the gospel writer and disciple who experienced a personal encounter with Jesus, later saw in prophetic vision the final scenes of earth's history. We read about it in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in, his, in righteousness he judges and makes war. The Messiah. They were expecting. The Messiah that was expected way back in the time of, 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 of John the Baptist is expected to come again as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. When we accept his invitation, my friends, to a personal encounter, when we experience the reality that Jesus wants to be our friend and Savior, that Jesus has come and died for our lifetime of sin and wretchedness, we experience the reality that one day soon, his invitation will no longer be, come see me, but see me come. Are you ready? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for being a God who loves us so much that you were willing to come down to this wretched planet Earth one that would reject the light, and yet you came down so that we could live with you forever as we accept your sacrifice in our behalf. And Lord, may that good news permeate the very fabric of our being and be the good news that we share and proclaim each and every day until at last we see you face to face. And may that day be soon, we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.